Okay. Um, hmm. I, I want to get some references so I can sort of talk on uh, how you can kind of classify line work as well. I think th that can be very helpful because um, yeah. the topic that you have there is how to develop your line work. And I think um, the, the best way actually probably would be from uh, reference and, and not like photo reference studies but like looking at other people's line work and picking things from there and then actually doing studies based on that line work i think that would probably be the best uh but uh, when you do study something to, um, sorry uh, i think it'd be good for you to ev eventually talk about how you got to your line work style because it's quite different like i've not seen a lot of people with your style before so Obviously, hmm. when you're starting out, you use all the references and you just learn the basics. But at some point, you you work into your own style. And I think it'd be good to know how you came into yours. Yeah, be... yeah. Well, it's sort of like ripping off people. So I think that's actually good <laughs> <Yeah>. to see. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, I think I'll talk on that at the end. There is, is my link working? Is that good? The YouTube link? Yeah, from my like from my Instagram story. Oh, I I just said I'll check. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll check now. <laughs> this is not alright. Okay. Um, um, I think these are good references. Yes, it's working. It's working fine. All right. Awesome. Okay. Now. Of course, this is not prepared, so I didn't like necessarily classify or like systematize this stuff in my head. So the explanation might be ever so slightly haphazard, but um, I want to talk about a couple different sort of uh, ways that you can, um, I guess, classify and group line work. So uh, um, I want to pull up some references. Um, this is good, I think. And. When it comes to um, <laughs> what is <laughs> what is the our sponsor rate? Okay, uh, getting back to this. When it comes to digital line work, it's sort of more broad. I feel like because when you work traditionally, uh, a medium will sort of put you in one of these brackets. Uh, if you're working with pencil, uh, you will have this kind of opacity to work with um, anyway. So I think. And of course, when you work with ink, you don't really have um, lightness, you only have line weight. So there's that distinction. And I think um, it's helpful to sort of separate these two, I guess. So um, when you think about developing your own style of working with lines, I think it's a good idea to ask yourself, do I want my lines, especially if you're working digitally, which I figure most people are at this point, you want to ask yourself, I think, <clears throat> whether you want it to look more like traditional ink or more like um, a drawing or maybe something in between. Uh, and, and then based on that, you can find references and sort of try to pick different elements of uh, each reference. But the way that I would separate things initially is essentially whether you're working with strong... Um, kind of opacity control. So as in the example of this uh, drawing by Claire Wendling, you can see that there are some quite light lines and, and then there are some pretty dark lines. And this is obviously pencil, so she has the ability to do that. And this is actually the pencil that I uh, that I work with or, or the brush that I work with when I do line work. So you can see that it's sort of in between. Um, I, I set it to a, it's got dual brush and <laughs> the, the way that I set up the pressure makes it very easy for me to get pretty dark but for me I like to be somewhere in between but then the other extreme of this would be something like Mike Mignola's line work which he uses like a liner for it and uh, within this kind of um, I guess separation within ink I think specifically or I guess let's you, you can think about it this way because because I am coming from a digital standpoint anyway uh, when you select the brush that you want to work with that's going to influence the final result you want to ask yourself whether uh, you're primarily your um, pressure is primarily going to affect lightness or, or like opacity or whether it's going to affect size and i think those are sort of the two factors the, the two 
characteristics that you're working with um, and there's like a whole spectrum between them and you can have more of one less of another so I think um, again still going from a um, a reference often a traditional reference can be good so you would usually want to land somewhere that's more pencil like or somewhere that's more like uh, inked style I guess from the very get-go and then when it comes to something like inking or, or really line work in general uh, there's also sort of two big things um, when you ink and when you primarily work with a like mainly dark opacity there are styles which emphasize like very simple rough line quality so in other words no real line weight to speak of such as something like this or or, or something like this and there are styles that actually have quite a deal of a uh, line weight although I didn't actually pick out a reference for that but that's something that you want to think about afterwards you want to ask yourself how much actual uh, line weight variation you want to have within your style and, and you'll notice that when it comes to something that has actual like very thin and very thick lines it often doesn't really necessarily need to work with a lot of these small dark ambient occlusion shapes because they're sort of built in because you have really thick dark lines and it also doesn't um, often doesn't have these very um, big black shapes and, and I consider this um, sort of an element of line work to a certain degree like for example here if you look at this drawing um, it has hatching and it has these very dark shapes but you wouldn't necessarily say that this is not line work it's just inked in a certain way so that's the second question that you want to ask yourself after you ask yourself whether you want to work with a lot of um, line weight or not you also want to ask yourself how many uh, dark tones do you actually want to include and when it comes to um, sort of the tools that you have um, when doing line work obviously uh, so this is like a different more like fundamental breakdown we, in here I was just talking about more about technique and tools but fundamentally the lines that you have to work with are really two types of lines and I think this is a good example <coughs> of that of course there is um, the use of line here to indicate some value and some shadow but um, generally you have outlines and this is very like obvious stuff to a certain degree but it's helpful to classify this way because from this leads a question of how much of each type of line you want to use uh, and that's going to affect the complexity of the style and, and the overall aesthetic so you would have outlines which are lines that you use to separate let's say like with this uh, arm they're just on the outside of any given object and they separate objects so they indicate um, a silhouette and they indicate overlap and then within those lines you have uh, cross contours so lines that are interior that you use to indicate form inside and um, you can work essentially only with outlines if you like and let me actually pull up a reference of that because I, I got a reference for it uh, I don't know how to spell this guy's name now. Yeah, okay, so Ryan Paulette here, his whole style is essentially um, just outlines. There's, there's very little uh, cross contour to speak of, and it's still very effective. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about how to use outlines effectively as well. But initially, this is just sort of the framework to think within. So this whole style is built on a complete lack of cross contour where something like Mobius also has you know certain pieces that are more more like that style but a lot of his um, art is um, falls within the bracket of a very low amount of um, line weight so most of the lines are quite similar again on some pieces more than others but he has essentially just outlines and then a lot of cross contours and it's a very paired down style because he never cross hatches so um, when it comes to using each of these let's sort of classify them here you got the cross contour and you got the outline and I want to talk about the tools that you have <laughs> or the ways in, we can, in which you can use each effectively so when it comes to outlines which I'll, I guess I'll just put this as an outline the most powerful tool that you have at your disposal is the T overlap because an outline and it's by its nature sort of flattens things it outlines it doesn't really have depth to it you generally want to look for opportunities to overlap your outline and bring it 
somewhat within the silhouette and this is referred to as a T overlap because it kind of looks like a letter T there and if you analyze good line artists they all use this like for example Kim Young-gi he, he was really really heavy on this and, and just a single line like this oh, you often you see it with, with this muscle here on the arm but a single line right there indicates so much because it, it tells you what is in front of what and if I were to go around these you would see these all over like for example in here this line come in, comes in, this line comes in, all of them, even though there is, you know, some separate objects here, even within one single object, like the muscles here, uh, there is a bunch of um, sort of entrance within the silhouette. So <coughs> when, it, when it comes to using the outlines, this is instrumental. You generally, unless you explicitly want to flatten your image, which most people don't, you generally don't want to just have a, a flat outline and you can see let's actually destroy this drawing here if I go in and actually get rid of that um, that little just little line it all of a sudden starts feeling a lot flatter so uh, the decision to do a T overlap uh, over a couple instances will add up into a lot of depth and decision to to sort of not use the opportunity will uh, as it adds um, up in, in, in multiple instances in the drawing it will flatten the drawing quite a lot even though it does appear as a small thing it happens all over the place and and if you look at something like this actually this is a good example of um, actually wanting to flatten because you can see that these lines don't really overlap and, and they they really could like you could actually bring this cl close it up bring it in and make sure that you know it's clear that maybe the brow is in front of the snout here and there's this form let's say the form looks something like this and this line would also indicate that uh, but he intentionally, the, the artist here, uh, intentionally, uh, Oscar Martin, he didn't want depth there because this is kind of a cartoony style. So that was a, an um, intentional, conscious decision uh, made on his part. And then when it comes to cross contours, really you have two main ways to use them. Um, and I think I'll use this hand or this arm as an example again. Uh, usually when it comes to talking about a cross contour, you want to go across the form. Uh, and use it to indicate volume. And in most cases, something that's close to a 90 degree angle to your gesture, so you have the long axis of whatever it is you're drawing, something that's approximating a 90 degree angle across it will usually convey the most form. Of course, you can go like diagonally or, or at a slight angle, but if I, if I go in here and I use my lines like this, they're not, first of all, they're, they're not really cross contours, and second of all, they're not really explaining the form too well, but if I use them like this, then that really explains the, the curving of this uh, form in this particular example here. So, in general, in most cases, when it comes to using cross contour, and, and when you're not intending to imply um, value with it, uh, so when you're not hatching necessarily, you want to use cross contour to go across your form and not with your form. So if I was hatching here, uh, I could go like this, but if I really want to round out this form, I would probably want to go around there. Um, so that's the first thing, is it is just literally that 90 degree angle that you can generally stick to. Um, and of course, thinking about the actual form, the actual quality of it, the wireframe of it, and, and then uh, using the wireframe to move across. And you can actually, I don't know if I have a good reference here, because uh, these are really have a lot of cross contours. I, I use quite some cross contours in my uh, line work, but you can tell that, for example, here with using something so straight and diagonal, there's actually a bit of a flattening effect going on, and in here as well. And, and had he used, uh, this is not to say that there's anything wrong with it, but had he used something like this and gone across the form, um, it would actually look more voluminous. And th that's somewhat self-evident, but a lot of people will disregard that, especially when it comes to creating vol um, value and just like sort of um, mindlessly hatch in a single direction. So if you're not working with value, then this is the best way uh, to go. And, and this is uh, sort of all within the context of a particular kind of line work limitation or, or a line work style where we're actually doing lines. We're not trying to imply a light source uh, necessarily. So, and, and also, uh, those really, the stuff that I talked about here really doesn't uh, concern or, or is not related to the use of uh, line weight. So it doesn't matter how much line weight you actually use. These are sort of universal ideas that you can apply regardless. And I think on top of these two, um, 
there is then this line weight idea that kind of applies uh, broadly over them and then there's sort of an extra tool that you can use which is ambient occlusion um, and um, I say this because if you look at something like this uh, which is inked and it has these big flat shadows this is at a point where you would say it's inked but you wouldn't necessarily at least in like the digital kind of context you wouldn't call this line work uh, line work would generally not have so many shapes so many like flat dark shapes within it so, so that's what I'm talking about but you can sort of get a bit of the best of both worlds and I think this this image kind of shows that of course there are shadow shapes but there are also very small dark shapes that kind of hold the image together and kind of pop things out so that even without and, and I think this might be an even better example even without the use of very um, of a large sort of uh, variation in line weight you still kind of get a bit of an effect of it because you have like little glimpses of uh, dark shapes let me actually find another reference here because um, Mike Azevedo does this very well okay so maybe I should have looked up a sketch or something okay, this is a pretty old drawing of his apparently let me find a sketch as well he does this in his, uh, this in his uh, traditional sketches really nicely. Yeah, this is a good example. And I think this is this is a good way to start. The, exactly what I'm doing here, like the way that I'm explaining, is the way that I think you ought to, uh, or you should, analyze drawings when you're trying to figure out what kind of a style you want to go with and how you want to develop your uh, line work. But if you look at this, there's really not a lot of line weight but there are a lot of these ambient occlusion shapes and you'll notice as well that and he talks about this also in painting as well that a lot of them a lot of these small shadow shapes are kind of triangular they're just like either very flattened out triangles or, or just straight up small triangular shapes and you can imagine if i started removing these that this image would start uh, becoming a lot harder to read and it would also be flatter because uh, at that point, it wouldn't really be clear that this is so much on top, or that there is like actually um, like a step up here. It would sort of look like it's just pasted on top. So, um, just to recap, those are the three sort of tools when it comes to line work, or, or at least the way that I think about line work that you can use. You can use outlines. You can use. And you can't really go without outlines. You can have broken outlines, but you can't have a style with no outlines if you're doing line work. But you can't go without cross contours, in which case you would really need to rely a lot on T overlaps to achieve any any degree of depth. And then on top of those two, you can use slight pops of um, ambient occlusion to make the read uh, more immediate, regardless of whether you are actually using a lot of uh, line weight or not. And I think if we analyze some of these images as well, you might uh, see, like for example, even though it's it's a lot more subtle here, and it's more like a line weight th thing, there are still like these little triangles, and if I was doing something like, of course I wouldn't do it half as good as this, but if I was doing this drawing, I would definitely go in here, and like start adding those, and they would pop things out, but that's pretty much purely an, um, an aesthetic consideration, and it really depends on, on what you want to go with, and you have some of those shapes sort of in here to imply a bit of depth. So that would be like the the fundamental breakdown that I would uh, do if, if I was starting out the, the way that I would think about it. But um, I want to show, I think what Ellie suggested is a good idea. I want to show some line work examples. You just got to pull them up because there's a, a bunch of stuff here. It's a pretty big folder. But I, I want to show my line work and I want to show... But I can't necessarily pinpoint stuff, obviously, because because there's a lot of influences going on. But I can show a couple main ideas uh, that influenced me quite a bit. So I just gotta pull them up and drag them out. This is a different version of, of another uh, line work, which I think is also cool to see. Mm. This could be all right. I also I have a lot of line works saved up, which is good. Okay, that's decent. Hmm. Alright, that, that ought to be enough. Um, so, I actually didn't put them all in. No. 
travesty. Yeah, I wanted this one as well. I think those should be fine to analyze. <laughs> oh no, he's so much right. <laughs> yeah, I named that. <laughs> I named that drive when I was, um, I think I was like 14 or something. It's quite, it's still funny though, but uh, I, I want to show a couple uh, examples and, and I'll pull up um, inspirations, I guess, or, or um, line works that I lifted from as I talk about these. And uh, you'll notice as well that the uh, some of... Um, some of the way that I use certain um, elements from from different styles are, are very um, strange. Like, um, um, let's see. I think I'll I'll use Elisa here as an example of uh, me lifting some of her stuff. Although you wouldn't necessarily uh, you wouldn't necessarily guess because. Uh, of, of shape design, I think primarily. So, so you need to separate this, and I think that's an important uh, distinction as well. Is uh, when you look at somebody's line work, you can pretty much divorce it from um, the st the style in, in like the shape design stance. So this is a lot more realistic, a lot less kind of um, comic booky than what I do. Um, it's a lot better as well, but it's also got an interior sort of line, and and the medium is different as well. It's got this graphite texture, and it's got like more opacity distinction as well. But at the root of it, if you look at her style and what she does a lot, and this is literally like the hallmark of her style, apart from the the stump shading, it's the interior shapes and the very distinct specific cool. interior shapes. And then if you look at what's going on, let's say in this drawing, even though it's not as explicit or as obvious, um, or, or as effective in some uh, instances, there is a lot of um, almost like outlined interior shapes, uh, and you know, it's, in some cases they're more organic, it's, uh, they look more like squiggles, in some cases I was a lot more de deliberate with actually outlining things, but that is pretty much where I drew that idea from, and I sort of expanded on it a little bit and made it maybe less obvious in some examples and then kind of modified it a little bit. Um, and then, of course, I have the strong use of these um, small ambient occlusions as well, so that kind of uh, pops things out, and, and that's that's a characteristic that's not really present here, especially with you know how much darkness can actually be achieved with the mechanical pencil. So that starts to separate my style away from this as well. And another uh, kind of influence that I had here was um, Jaw Cooper. And I, I think it's interesting because this is, again, a, an entirely different style, but it's interesting to analyze the similarities between this, between the way that she draws, and the way that Elisa draws, and then maybe the way that I draw as well and notice some similarities, but I want to find a good uh, good example. I think I'll, I'll do some animal drawing, because she really uh, exaggerates there. Need to find a perfect example. Okay, this is pretty good. So, um, th this is a, a much more rough drawing of hers, and this is a, a very refined one, <coughs> but they do have a very similar characteristic to them. First of all, you'll notice as well that they do have these interior shapes uh, th that are outlined. It's not as if they're hatched. Um, and in general, if you were going for something a little bit more realistic, uh, maybe w what was done in the head here, you would want to hatch a transition, uh, and this doesn't really indicate a transition, it's more of just a sort of a cool shape, cool interior shape design. And if that was painted, maybe, you know, maybe this edge would be soft and this one would be hard. Uh, but she does have the interior shapes. She also has hatching on top, which is not really present in, in, in that way. There is some organic kind of scribbling stuff uh, in, in this style. And there are some repeated lines like this, but there's no cross hatching necessarily. Whereas here there is, there's, pretty much what I was talking about, almost a slight, at a slight angle, but there are lines going across a form at 90 degrees. And you'll also notice 
within her style, maybe the most sort of distinct feature, at least in these quick drawings, is the way that she forces the T overlaps. Uh, this might not be the perfect example, but uh, you see with how paired the style is uh, and with how little cross-hatching or rendering really there is, uh, a lot of depth is achieved simply by just bringing lines in and this is not really a good example there was a t tiger drawing that i remember that was like a, a really exaggerated example of this but she obviously thinks about this and what she does as well you know sometimes she actually foregoes the t overlap like for example here if she really wanted depth that she might have actually like overlapped the pelvis here and the shoulder blade there so it's, it's a matter and I'm, I'm certain almost that at this level of drawing this is a consideration that's um at some level at least conscious like you know, she knows that she can do it, but she chooses not to. But, for example, here, where the leg overlaps the body, she does it very aggressively. And then also, um, the point that I was getting to is she, she brings in an interior shape along with the T overlap a lot. And it's just a very cool kind of mixture of using a T overlap. Um, and then also interior shapes, th these kind of outlined interior shapes as um, sort of one thing, kind of mixing them together. Yeah, Claire Wendling's drawings are just amazing as well. Um, and, and there was, I think, a little bit of a Claire Wendling influence as well. But I think those might be, like, the main influences. And then when it comes to this sort of, like, um, maybe, like, a more flat, um, I guess, lack of line weight, especially to, like, the big lines, it's not as if... Uh, and I think this is a good example of that as well, because I have two variations of, a, of the same kind of inked, or I guess this drawing is more drawn, whereas this one is more inked, you can see that I'm really not capitalizing on any strong line weight, whereas here I have a very strong outline, and I also added um, actual, like, inked blacks, so so I, I would usually go with this kind of an approach, and it's, it's, I think, partially just in the process, I kind of enjoy it, like, not having to worry about um, that aspect, you know, this, this, uh, brush is generally just the same um, thickness and also it's partially like what I enjoy more the look that I enjoy more um, but I think a part of this might be like a, a mic as a uh, not a mic as a video but a Mike Mignola ref um, not reference but just like inspiration because when he does lines it actually looks somewhat similar but it's 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 possible although difficult to find his drawings before he blocks in the uh, the darks. But if you look at some of the lines, and, and there's also, um, yeah, of course, um, although I, I haven't really ta um, thought about this consciously, but there is a Sergio Toppi influence as well, um, I've been told. So let's just pull up, pull up that. <laughs> and you see that my style looks almost nothing like this, uh, but I... From from this uh, artist, I just lifted mostly like the flattening that he does. Um, he he has a tendency to really flatten some areas, and he's obviously masterful at creating depth. But he just chooses, for example, like here, just using silhouettes, either actual like shapes or, or outlines as well. But he will often choose to um, instead of placing, let's say, a limb in perspective, he'll just place it, for example, as with this head, he'll just place it in a full profile, um, and the person that does this really well in, in a more uh, concept arty setting is uh, Faraz Shanyar, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but you can see the similarity in style, ho hopefully here, although this is digital and it's a little bit of a different technique, uh, but maybe you can see the influence of this on me as well, like this is kind of similar to the way that I work, uh, except I think I have a, a bit, obviously I don't have tone, this is, it's kind of hard to tell what the line is like exactly, and also don't have um, volume hatching necessarily, although maybe I'll, I'll develop sort of a, a shoot off of that style, but yeah, something like this is actually like a little element, so uh, this is kind of haphazard, but I'm just like showing you elements of stuff that I enjoy, that I lift from, that are very different, in the sense that it's not all about line, Th this is more of a like, um, a depth choice, but it, it's shown through line. It's like this simple outline, broken line in a very flat kind of uh, dimension that I enjoy. So those are, I guess, a couple of influences uh, on 
my drawing and I figured that might be interesting to see when it comes to lifting things because it shows how um, abstractly you, you actually can pick things out like you don't have to um, like you can literally take 10 separate very odd unexpected things from from each uh, artist that you enjoy and mix them together and then it's gonna look generally at least nothing like those artists because it's an amalgamation and a mixture of them and that's probably the best way to work as well that's the best way to think about building up your line work style and I think the best medium or sort of the best practical way to do it is with something low pressure and and with some reference as well because then you'll you'll literally have an experience of filtering information from reference into a drawing which is for me at least probably doing male figure drawing so some of these were actually very very helpful when it came to developing the way that I draw when I invent things because I had somewhat of a stress-free but also like a fun setting where I could just experiment with both the way that I um, kind of technically build up the drawing and then also just the way that I um, execute the final line work and this was a bit of an experiment as well like you see that this has blacks and it also has um, value hatching and it has some smudging as well so it's a mixture of many things but it also still has like separate shapes inside it has some of those characteristics that you'll see like T overlaps in here and a lot of these um, ambient occlusion little shapes but yeah I guess that would be my my whole spiel on developing line work all right so, does anyone have any questions regarding this uh, lecture so far nice Look, I, I stumble over my words, okay? It's, uh, it's what I was, you know. Oh, I okay. Um, yeah, audio is only coming from the left. Okay, that's that's a stereo issue, yeah. Um, yeah, we can fix it easily next time. But, yeah, you're just going to have to suffer through this. Oh, sorry about Someone that. Someone asks, what was the name of the candle character artist? Uh, Ryan Palette. Let me type it out. Oh, hold up, actually. How do you, how do you spell that? It's a strange name, it's kind of difficult to spell. Oh, he's got two L's and two T's. There it is. <coughs> he's got... I mean, obviously his line work is so pared down that he's... Uh, and I think it's intentional because his work really hinges on good shapes and, and interesting characters that have personality. So uh, I think that's like the, the most appealing thing like I found him out through those candle characters and they're just that that was just so cool and and like I, I would love to see a show with this kind of not only style but also like a design sense like this this is really good it also looks like it's fairly quick to do so he can create series like this easily okay uh, uh, someone stick. asked did, did you intentionally study line work with other artists at some point or were you just drawing their stuff for the sake of design um oh um i have i have whole uh whole notebooks of me copying actually i completely failed to mention this but like gracopolo for example is a i guess somewhat of an obvious he actually i get i guess i got a lot of his cross uh contours in my work but I have like had periods where I would for my studies like in the morning I would just copy other people's drawings and it was more uh, just finding good um, good draftsmen that are it's not this it wasn't necessarily about line work exactly I was just doing rougher versions of their drawings but I think I picked up a lot of like those final surface things from doing those studies but I, I never did necessarily literally copy and I think there is value to that but the value is somewhat limited because um, the, the issue is the filtering of information so you can do uh, master studies and sort of copies but then I think th the most uh, value can be derived and you can progress the most by actually trying to apply it uh, both obviously by doing your work, which I would do with a reference, so that you can always look and compare. And also, I think initially, more so by doing studies from um, some reference or like life drawing. Because it sort of mixes the influence with 
a topic that you're trying to tackle and you're actually doing what they were doing it's sort of a weird thing because there's a um you can very easily fall into copying when you're uh just replicating somebody's lines and those lines they don't actually uh, well they obviously if they were drawing from a model they didn't see them so they had to filter a lot of information and they had to make specific decisions uh, which again the best way for you to become able to do that is by making your own decisions i guess from reference initially but 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 also having their reference as something to guide you <laughs> at least aesthetically initially it's sort of weird because uh, uh, line work is very very tied to fundamental drawing um concepts and it's kind of difficult to separate them and i talked a bit about like the actual tools and and but both like uh, in terms of technique and in terms of like fundamental kind of aspects of tools. But at the end of the day, it, it really all does come down to very fundamental, um, just very fundamental issues in drawing, like maintaining a good basic structure, for example. And if you're, at least uh, for me, that sounded extremely abstract when I was um, developing in drawing, because you do see... Uh, when you see a final drawing, you see the surface layer of it, but only as you actually start improving and getting better, do you actually start grasping how much of everything is just based on the fundamental. And it sounds like washed out and, and like repetitive because everybody says it, but you kind of, I guess, have to experience it to understand it. But um, yeah, I think that's why, <laughs> again, it might not be as useful, or at least it wasn't as useful to me to do... Um, just line work studies, but rather like figuring out how did they tackle this gesture or how did they tackle suggesting this uh, structure. I guess I, I, I think I would, I got more value out of it. All right, uh, let's quickly answer two more questions, then we'll move on to the feedback part of Teaching Tuesdays. Uh, so yes. one question is from Beloved and he says, I really like how you have focal points in each image. Uh, Ossidy, sorry. Please, can you talk about your your mindset on those figure studies? Mm. Well, it, it, with these actually in particular, I wanted to use value contrast and, um, I, and I have different approaches, but I, here I was really trying to have these dark values and a lot of detail create contrast and by extension focal points. So, and I think this is, this I think nicely kind of um, spread through into something show like um, gotta uh, get some line works <laughs> something like this even that's very rough um, where because I, I studied from reference I think this is a great example of that actually because it's very similar if you look at it in, in style it doesn't have necessarily the smudging but it does have a very strong dark that functions against the white background as uh, a focal point and it also has this, uh, first of all, initially a uh, lack of detail, and sort of gradient where you lose detail and then at the very end, just a silhouette. So I did intentionally in, with these studies want to focus on figuring out how I can render form fairly realistically with cross contour and also use uh, hatching and cross hatching to indicate value. So that, that amount of detail in rendering uh, coupled with these very dark shapes would create strong contrast and maybe at the time I wasn't necessarily thinking about it that way but if I can um, kind of extrapolate this and use it practically on a uh, a character design or, or line work then I can get a lot quicker because I filter out things that I deem unnecessary so I don't just indiscriminately render like the feet for example the same way that I would render the face, because the, the face is supposed to be the focal point, and it also has more important detail with the expression. So I, I focus um, my lines, and when I say like contrast in this context, it just means the more rendering I have, the more contrast it will have in this situation, because rendering will be lines, lines will be detail, uh, often value as well, and then that's going to attract attention against these areas that are just pretty much bare. Uh, beer. So, yeah, uh, I guess that's that's my that was my thinking. But these are done quite far apart. So sometimes 
the studies that you do don't necessarily sink in um, and initially and it takes a little bit of time to digest them and sometimes you just don't have a practical uh, kind of piece to apply them to yet but ideally you would actually want to uh, if I was doing this ideally then I would try to do and I think fan art is a good option as well because you have the design figured out so, so that's what I've been doing lately because I don't have to think about designing anything I can just draw and focus on drawing through a fan art but again ideally you would have the study and then some way quickly enough uh, in, in your personal art to apply that study so that the knowledge actually uh, sticks and your brain realizes it as something you'll actually be using instead of just like a vague um, concept in, in drawing yeah okay. uh, last question and it is what is your take or tip about coloring line art nice good question okay so uh this is actually, uh, there, there's nothing crazy to it. Let me open up this file. Essentially, I just, uh, let, let's open another one. Maybe there's a better, actually I have the, that Rexar is a good example also. So I, I just think about it. I think about coloring. Uh, let's, let's get rid of these layers. And yeah, let's also make this grayscale. Um, I guess it'll be multiply, but just so it's a bit easier to see. I think about it uh, almost as if I was actually using more opacity in the actual drawing, um, but at, at least at the gray scale um, kind of version, I'm not, um, when I color lines at, at the core of it, I'm not necessarily thinking about their color exactly, although that's a layer on top that adds interest and is just fun. But, I usually just lighten things that are supposed to have less contrast again. So, so it's actually quite simple. I'll. Um, it, it also depends somewhat on the local value of whatever uh, color is underneath. So I'll go and I'll color. I don't know if you're ask, asking about actually coloring line work or doing flat colors underneath line work, but I'm just gonna stick with coloring line work because I find that I find it fun. So I'll usually. Uh, consider those two things fading things out uh, where I need less contrast where I don't want to attract attention and then also somewhat matching the local color so you can see here for example with these brown gloves these dark gray gloves my drawing is almost black whereas with the yellow skin I'll get something very saturated and I often like to go very saturated but it's not necessarily a rule and in this case um, there's sort of a similar thing going on a little bit less fading out but um, Really what I did here was just one aspect of, of what I was doing in the Rexar drawing where I made the light local uh, color or, or the lines that are on light local color I made them very light and then I left this dark and, and I think that helps Almost indicate uh, material or indicate like softness as well. So the skin feels a lot softer especially with like how um, The exact color that I chose it feels a lot softer than this metal material but those are the two main considerations, the actual local colors beneath and then uh, contrast, like light, lightening up things that need to go further back or that need to attract less attention. Okay. Uh, if you guys want to start posting your work for feedback, I mean, it seems that we've already gotten quite a few posts. Um, but yeah, we'll move on to, to that right now. Uh, are you still streaming, Antonio? Uh, yes, often? I am. Sam. Okay, do you want to end uh, it before we start giving feedback? Um, let's start the feedback and then we're going to end the stream. Let's do, just do one feedback and then we can end the stream. Sure. All right, so our first submission is from Newt. Oh, I see uh, the, the merchant guy. You you applied the, I remember him, you applied the feedback that we gave you. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like the, the human character as well. That's, that's sick. So really good job. I think they're strong designs. I think they're really <coughs> great. Um, I don't have a lot to say about the human guy, um, but the merchant, um, there's, there's a couple of things that sent out to me. Um, and not a lot, like I'm nitpicking a little bit here because I do like your designs. Uh, the first is that the hand gets a little lost over his body. Um, in from what I can see anyway. It just, um, I don't know if it's a value issue. I don't i don't think so, but it just looks a little lost. Like I can't really see him holding the the staff properly. Um, his other forearm as well, holding the little the bag looks 
rather thick. Um, it doesn't seem to match the arm holding the staff. Like it, it looks a bit too too big. Um, so that should be an easy fix. Just make it a little smaller. And then I, I, would, I would also actually maybe put stuff in the satchel over his bag, back. Sorry, because um, I'm not sure if that's closed or open right now. But it would be cool if you added like some things in there to show like what he's carrying, what his purpose is. It would add a bit more design into there and more narrative as well, which I think would really push this piece. And um, I, oh, I'm a bit all over the place with his feedback. I apologize, but um, I would also maybe push the horns a little bit and like, y make them just a bit, maybe a little bit bigger. Maybe if they're like a main part of him, like which I'm assuming it is because of like his species, right? It's like a fawn. Um, you could like make them a bit more majestic maybe. And also the staff as well. Maybe add some leaves on there if it's made out of wood. Um, more twists and turns maybe. Just a bit more design into this piece will really push it. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say about about that guy. Yeah, yeah I think the issue with the, the hand is actually like a, a triple sort of a tangent that you've got here. Initially, the, maybe the worst kind of tangent is the way that it's tangenting with the silhouette itself. So that it's unclear what the overlap is and also it's it, this shape doesn't actually read on the outside of the silhouette so from afar we can't really tell that there's a hand there um, if this was just a flat value it wouldn't be obvious but then on top of that you have an overlap uh, or a tangent with this overlap here where the forearm continues onto the rope and that makes the depth read on this side also difficult to understand and it's just a, an awkward tension that's created and then somehow uh, for whatever reason the stick overlapping with it here uh, maybe because you don't have a negative shape in there it, it's just it's almost like it's uh, adding on top of <laughs> this um, tangent so that is the I think the main thing that stands out here but then on top of it um, I have just a couple uh, ideas the first is kind of in line with what Ellie was saying, where um, I would try and... I think this is sort of a proportion issue, with where some elements are like larger than others. Uh, when it comes to the smaller things, it looks like this uh, hand is a bit bigger than this one, which wouldn't maybe even make sense, because this seems to be coming forward. But then, of course, there's the forearm, and I feel like the whole torso... Um, maybe because I'm trying to compare it to human proportions, but it feels a little bit small um, based on both how long the legs are, because the legs are actually sort of like this long if he was to stand up entirely. So it, it feels like this is a little bit small. Uh, maybe this is a personal preference, but I would probably make it just a little bit bigger. Or alternatively, what you could do is actually... And, and this is, I guess, may, maybe a better, more fundamental way to explain this. Um, if you make something only a little bit uh, off or a little bit different in terms of proportions it usually feels awkward because we can't tell if it's deliberate or if that's the idea so if you actually want to have like these big strong legs maybe he moves really quickly then I would actually just go with that and make those maybe even bigger maybe even like wider uh, that might look awkward you would probably have to change up some shapes but I would actually go with that idea maybe you would just have to make them like thicker or, you know, a mix of, of those two ideas. Um, but maybe that's a more broad um, principle to talk about rather than necessarily, you know, just making the torso bigger. Uh, so any piece uh, of the design, any big or small shape, you can look to see if, um, you know, it's slightly different size than what would be expected. As, you know, the human proportions are obvious, but then, you know, with swords, for example, you can do the same thing. And if it is, um, you can look to push it. <coughs> I think in this case, well, I have another really small thing. I would probably move this at a bit of an angle so that it's at 90 degrees. Because it just feels a little bit more natural having this uh, band over top of the arm. Uh, but then, when it comes to um, the design of the horns, I really... You know, you could push it, as Ali mentioned. I pr probably, with how realistic the overall proportions are, probably wouldn't go too far. But you could maybe get a little bit more of these twirlies to match this shape design. But what I think would actually give you the most bang for your buck is 
to tie this uh, with color and texture and echo the staff and kind of theme the character a little bit more and I think the um, benefit would be twofold because initially you would um, get just the repetition of, of a similar color so th there would be a higher cohesion within the design but then on top of that um, this would read as a dark shape against light shapes and it would contrast so you wouldn't even necessarily need to add too many smaller elements like leaves and stuff if you do have a dark shape like this the function is a, functions as an accent especially since the whole body is actually light and all of these other accents really are dark but i think um adding a little bit more um of design with with leaves or maybe with patterns of course stuff in here and, and when it comes to adding stuff i would think about maybe creating some sort of a backstory to it like specifically what he would be selling i think that would be good but just darkening it like this <laughs> is good as well uh, i'm also noticing right now when we're on the topic of the uh, we talked about the tangent here i'm noticing that there's a bit of a tangent in here as well it's a lot less uh important than this it doesn't really matter too much but it, it kind of makes the overlapping a little bit strange um i don't know exactly how it's solved it but i guess you could just bring it up like, since this is already so gnarly the staff is you can just move it out like this uh, maybe not that much because you need some negative space there but you know this could be a, an all right shape and it could come out as well uh, maybe a little bit more clearly so in the silhouette that could be helpful as just making it stand out and reading a bit better but I, yeah i think that would be everything when it comes to that character and then i think this one works really well so i wouldn't really even touch on it uh, this can is I actually have, a good example of, one go thing? ahead Augie, um, Go ahead. Consistent, I always see reoccurring when people do organic designs is that the there's no gradation. So the horns yeah. feel like they're pasted on top of the skin. The fur yeah, yeah, yeah. on the legs feel like it, it's like a pants. Feels like there's no organic flow or gradient from one material into another. It's something I see happen all the time. It's one of the most common mistakes. Is when you want to want to create something that feels natural you want to add gradation to it whether it's a creature design it's a fawn design like this i see it with you know even dragon designs as well just look at nature right you will rarely see an abrupt stop from one material or even one color into another yeah yeah and, and when it comes to like organic textures even something like a hoof might have like hair on it or, or a texture that, that gradates there there's usually within any element um when we're thinking about creature design there's usually some type of gradation even if it's not necessarily gradating from like a separate type of material into another there will usually for example on the legs be um say like a, a darkening maybe on top and the lightning on bottom so, so that idea could be taken even further but yeah this is like and i, I sort of thought about that but then i forgot to mention it um if if you do add the darkening especially since it's so contrasty an abrupt ending would make it even worse so like for example in here in this case what i dislike is is that there's a lack of contrast but what i do like is that it feels less abrupt whereas here it's it, even though it's a more contrasty element and it's an important design element the connection is so abrupt that it feels off so it's sort of like if you could get both to work that would be ideal I guess right. horns are are uh, horns are like um, an element that you can sort of um, ignore this idea on, but it does feel when you're creating a like um, creature design. Uh, it, when you look at a, like a, a ram or something, we've seen rams, so it's not off-putting to see an abrupt stop like that. But if it's a human with the ram elements, it does feel kind of like a Frankenstein's monster, like things are pasted on top. And it's really, I think, since we are so used to seeing animals that do have these abrupt endings, but you will, like, uh, I don't know, like, for example, like on that reference image, the nose as well has an abrupt ending, but that's just like, the eye has an abrupt ending, but you're kind of used to that. <coughs> and if, if that was a human face with, with that horn, it might feel a little bit more awkward. All right, All right. Yeah. Set, I'm going to end the live stream. Uh, yep. Gotcha. All right. So if you if you guys want to join in on this, join at Ward, and you can participate in Teaching Tuesdays and receive feedback. 
Yep. Exactly. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right.